Cool. Thanks very much, Rochelle. And thank you again for having me. It's, it's always lovely to, to speak to you guys. Um, it's always an absolute treat, so thank you. Um, yeah, so my name's Sammy. I'm actually the Zoom product manager at ConnectNZ. So we're a um, 40-year-old AV company. Um, and I spend my days uh, doing large license deployments. We do Zoom rooms, we do Zoom phone, we do a little bit of everything. I do all the public facing stuff for the company. Um, and anyone that knows me, I just, I can't stop talking about Zoom. <laughs> they use the word passionate. <laughs> I don't know if they're being polite, maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but everyone knows that I'm very passionate about Zoom. I genuinely believe that the company and um, their wonderful leader, Eric at the helm, um, have everyone's best interests at heart. And I think that's one, incredibly rare, and two, um, quite a beautiful thing for a company to do for its for its users. Um, and so that's one of the reasons why, why I love Zoom. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to be talking about today is kind of my top 10 tips, I suppose, or, or elements of Zoom um, that I know that definitely not everyone will know. A lot of them you may know, um, but hopefully you, you will learn, learn something. Um, I do tend to go on a little bit, so I've got my timer here, Michelle, so I'm going to try and six to 45. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to share, I've got a little slideshow for you, um, and I will just get right into it. All right, oh, it's making stuff a little bit bigger here. Um, all righty, yeah, so, so, so top 10 Zoom tips. Um, so I'm going to start first off with a really important one, I think, and this is integrations. So everyone knows Zoom, it's a beautiful platform. You've got your chat, you've got your video, you've got your voice, you've got your rooms, you've got everything you need inside of that collaboration space. But what Zoom also needs to do, as does any other solution, is it needs to play really well in your corporate playground. Whatever other tools you have, it needs to work really well with them um, to create those automated workflows to make it easy for your users and your administrators and your managers as well. Um, and a lot of things that people don't experience or don't even really understand is, is the power and the ability inside of the Zoom marketplace. Um, so what I'll do after the session is I'll have a whole bunch of links that I can just send, send to you guys, inclusive of the Zoom marketplace. You can search for a keyword or a product and see if there's anything that Zoom offer in that space. Um, but I thought I'd mention a couple of really, really important ones. Um, the first one that I mentioned um, is actually this um, schedule a meeting. So this is the Zoom Outlook plugin. You may not be uh, Outlook users, um, but there is a Gmail one as well. Um, but the Zoom Outlook plugin, one, allows you to schedule from your email, which is great. I'm, I live in my emails. Um, so if I can schedule from there, then that's great. But what it actually does is it allows you to have your email invites in HTML format. So this is my invite, just a little snippet of my Zoom invite here. And we've got the nice Connect NZ branding and the Connect NZ colors throughout that invite. So if you've got a company with strong brand presence, or if you just want to have your own colors and your own look and feel to whatever you're sending out into those that, that public facing, um, it's really important to have your branding on there. Um, and that's actually only possible with the Zoom Outlook plugin because that's what refers, uh, sorry, um, um, pu pushes that a, a invite into a HTML format to allow you to have all of that really great branding. I think it's really important that if you are ever sending an invite, that it does come from you and your company, not just from Zoom. Um, so having that HTML format, getting all that branding done is a really, really beautiful packaged way to send that invite to people. Um, another integration that is only getting better and better is the Microsoft Teams integration. Obviously, Microsoft Teams has been around for eons and eons. Um, and people say all, all the time, you know, Sam, I'm a Microsoft house. How is Zoom going to work in my Microsoft house? Um, and that's an incredibly valid question, to which I always say that you should be in a Zoom house. <laughs> um, but, but regardless, um, they, they do need to play well. So the Teams plugin um, with Zoom allows you to sit inside of your Teams chat planner, uh, channel and your collaboration um, scenario inside of Teams, but start meetings, schedule meetings, and share screen using the power of Zoom. Teams is that perfect collaboration platform, but their video experience is just growing. At the end of the day, it's quite new in the market, whereas Zoom's been around and proven and market leading for about eight years now. Um, so to be able to have the, the power of both of those tools is really, really important. You get the best of both worlds in that scenario. So you don't have to force your users off Teams. You don't have to create a whole bunch of friction by moving them entirely to a different tool. You can use Teams for your chat. You can use Zoom for your video collaboration and they work really seamlessly together with the integration that Zoom and Microsoft have, have worked really hard on um, completing. 
Um, that does actually move forward into the Zoom rooms as well. So we're trialing a beta at the moment um, that allows you to send any Teams invite to a Zoom room. A Zoom room, for those who haven't seen one, um, is just a meeting room uh, solution by Zoom. It's all run by a touch controller. It's a beautiful solution. If you hadn't heard of one or seen one, definitely have a look. Um, but you can now send Teams invites to a Zoom room and join Teams meetings from your beautiful room system. Um, so that, that Teams and Microsoft integration is is uh, really strengthening and it's just getting bigger and bigger, which is which is really perfect. Um, a couple of the other integrations on the marketplace, as I mentioned, there's like, I think maybe over 2000 now and they are just keep adding them on. And they're also really interested to hear what integrations you want. So if you have any that aren't listed, always get in touch with Zoom. Um, but ServiceNow and Jira are really important ones. Um, if you are using those for any of your service desk or your support or your help desk, having that automation of your tools, flowing those tickets through ServiceNow and Jira, being able to log your Zoom calls against those tickets, obviously everyone's time is incredibly important. You need to hang on to every minute of it and it needs to be logged accordingly. So, so those two integrations at ServiceNow and Jira, very important. Um, and then we've obviously got our wonderful G Suite plug in there as well with the uh, Google, uh, the Gmail, so you can schedule and start directly from your Gmail platform as well, um, which is obviously really important. I mentioned the, the Outlook, but there's obviously that Gmail component also. All right, next tip um, is screen sharing. So screen sharing is obviously incredibly important. It's really powerful inside that collaboration space. Um, and this is actually also an update that's just come out is what I'm doing. So this is the ability to share PowerPoint as your virtual background, which just it kind of blows my mind really because it creates such a much more interactive experience rather than having you know a full screen PowerPoint and then a little little old me over on the side. It allows you to have that really cool interactive functionality when you are sharing whatever you're sharing really. Um, I did some really cool things with like the Brady Bunch picture and I was one of the little Brady Bunch people on the side. I mean, you can share whatever you like behind you as long as it's in PowerPoint, but it really allows you to just, just encourage that interactiveness and also bring you a little bit um, front of stage as well. Um, when you do, you know, when you're on so many Zooms, you can kind of get a little bit fatigued by seeing so many PowerPoints and so many Excel spreadsheets. And having a person there just makes it a little bit more animated, a little bit more enjoyable to watch. And that's really important. I think every Zoom meeting should be fun. It should be enjoyable. Um, and this is a really good way to just step them up a little bit. Um, I work very heavily in the event space. Um, I do a lot of event facilitation. So Leon, if you ever want any <laughs> help, you let me know. Um, but so, and this is really important as well for speakers. So if you've got keynote speakers that are performing at large events, they are either being paid a lot of money or paying a lot of money to be there. They don't want to be a little small thumbnail on the side of your screen. They want to be as front and center as they can whilst producing their content. And this is a really great way for them to do that. Now, the next one is something that I tell every single one of my customers to do. Um, and it's actually an individual user setting, unfortunately. So it can't be done at an account level, but it allows you to have so much easier screen sharing. So it's just under your settings in your desktop client. You've got that cog at the top right under your share screen segment. And it's this one here, which is so show Zoom windows during screen share. Um, now, on as an aside to that, it's always easy to have dual monitors. Have your laptop and then have a dual monitor. Have your uh, PowerPoint on your dual monitor. And as long as you have this, um, this option uh, checked here, show Zoom windows during screen share, it's going to allow you to share that monitor and your Zoom will remain entirely intact on your other device. So you don't lose everyone. You don't lose all the thumbnails. It stays exactly as it is here. And I like that. It means that I don't have to you know, try and navigate through the little tiny menus to find my chat or participants. It stays exactly as it is whilst I'm screen sharing full screen on my second monitor. So this for me absolutely changes my life. I do a lot of screen sharing um, and this has made it 10,000 times easier for me. Um, I, I, so I see chats coming in, thank you, love them, um, but I will get to them afterwards just so I can keep going. Um, and the next ones, uh, I'm sure everyone would know this, um, but the share computer sound and optimize screen sharing for video clips. So whenever you are sharing content, this will appear, these two little tick boxes at the bottom of your share screen window. Share computer sound, obviously, if you want to push that audio through, if you're sharing a video clip or anything off YouTube, you obviously want that audio to be pushed through. And then this one here. So this is where a lot of people actually get caught up. So optimize screen sharing for video clips. So this should only be ticked if you are sharing a moving video clip. 
if you tick this when you're sharing an Excel spreadsheet or text, it will make it worse. Zoom will overprocess it and make it blurry. So it's really key. I mean, people see the word optimize and they're like, oh, love it. I'll optimize the heck out of my PowerPoint. Let's do that. That's not what it does. <laughs> um, so only do it if you're sharing a full screen video clip or other video clip with you know those, those moving parts. So very, very important. Um, next is Zoom chat. So, I mean, I've done huge deployments. I mean, New Zealand loves Zoom. All of our local and national government love Zoom. Um, and I actually found out that one of our largest CHVs over here only just found out about Zoom chat. And I mean, they've been using Zoom since I was here. So two and a half years now. And they've literally never touched Zoom chat. I don't know if they're, you know, they're partial blind. It's just all fun now that they're missing. I don't know. But they've never touched it. And for anyone who hasn't used Zoom chat, um, if you use Teams chat, it's effectively the same thing. Your Slack, your Skype, all of those things. It's just your instant messaging platform. However, the thing, in my opinion, that really moves Zoom ahead of the curve is the ability to jump into a Zoom call with anyone in your chat really, really quickly. Um, so rather than scheduling a Zoom meeting, sending them the email, waiting for them to get it, letting them all join in, you can reach out using this little Zoom icon up the top left here. Um, reach out to either a group of users or an individual user instantly. Click the button, it'll pop up on their screen that you're calling them, they click accept and you're in a Zoom call straight away. For someone like me who would rather Zoom rather than email or phone call, this saves me at least maybe half an hour a day, which is very precious time for me. Um, so jumping into a Zoom call really quickly, especially for that internal communication, and I think encouraging people to use Zoom the, and especially the video platform, having that video first culture is a really powerful thing for a company to do. I think it's really uh, important for people to connect in whatever way they possibly can, even if it's virtually, and being able to see someone, being able to connect with their eyes, being able to notice their mannerisms. You do connect with them on a slightly different level. So jumping into a Zoom call rather than jumping on the phone or rather than sending an email is going to give you a much more enriching experience from a relationship perspective as well. Um, you've obviously got the ability for Zoom phone. So if you do just want to dial out quickly using Zoom phone, you can also do so there. Um, I'm, I'm video first, I'll always will be. But some people, especially people who are still in that audio conferencing headspace, which is absolutely fine. But it once again allows them to just really quickly dial out using that Zoom phone button to whomever they like, internal, external, no problem. Uh, what you've also got is your little abilities inside of that Zoom chat. So you can send screenshots, you can send files, you can record a little message. Um, you have your own little private um, meeting chat, so with yourself. Um, and I use the record message all the time. So if I've just gone out and gotten out of a meeting and I don't, don't want to jump into OneNote on my phone, I'll record myself a little message of an overview of the meeting and just post it to myself, my little internal channel here. So I've got all these little voice clips of really important things that because I just brain dump everything, I get everything that I need rather than desperately trying to type. I hate typing on my phone. I can't stand it. Um, so if I can just record a little voice clip, post it on my own personal channel just to me, it's something that I can listen to later and then write the appropriate action points or bullet points moving forward. Um, so yeah, so Zoom chat for me, hugely time saving. It is chat based, obviously, so it's still nice and quick. Type, enter, done. Um, I use these, uh, a lot of chat with my customers as well. It's a, an extra kind of um, support program that we offer. You can send me a chat. I can escalate a ticket for you or answer a quick question rather than pull it to the, the help desk. So chat for me, yeah, hugely powerful and many of our customers as well. Moving on to virtual backgrounds. So obviously you can have PowerPoint as a virtual background, which is great. Um, but not a lot of people utilize virtual backgrounds or a lot of people actually do them just when they jump into a meeting. So if you have a look at the, the little uh, black, uh, black snippet there, that's when you're inside of a meeting and you can choose your virtual background. But you can actually access the settings directly from your desktop client. And you can upload whatever you like. So you can have images, you can have videos, and you can have all of that already in your album of your virtual backgrounds. Um, you've also got a whole bunch of video filters. Um, I can't put any on, but I will put on some later. I've posted some really horrifically unattractive pictures of me with a mustache into our Connect Sales channel, and everybody loved it. <laughs> um, so there's lots of little fun things you can do with, with the filters. But I think the background is really important from, once again, that kind of branding perspective. 
So I've mentioned down here that you can deploy account level background. So if you've got a marketing team or a branding team or anyone that wants to push that brand of that company out, you can, as an account admin, load up virtual backgrounds into your Zoom tenancy portal and it will appear for all of your users so they don't have to individually upload it. So you might want to have a nice, you know, soothing background with a great company logo up the corner and then you can just deploy that to all of your users so they're ready to just put it on whenever they want. So if you've got speakers, if you've got, you know, salespeople, help desk engineers, anyone that's public facing, having a virtual background that is really synchronized across your organization it's just really strengthening that branding. I think that's really important. Um, yes, that's, that's the virtual backgrounds. Uh, moving on to breakout rooms. So breakout rooms are amazing. Zoom just pushed out a recent update, which is genuinely saving my life. And it allows the participants inside of breakout rooms uh, to actually choose their own room. So for those who don't know what a breakout room is, it is only available inside of the Zoom meetings platform, not the Zoom webinar platform. Um, but it basically allows you to put your meeting participants into little sub meetings. Inside of these sub meetings, they've got audio, they've got video, they can share content, they're effectively in their own little meeting environment, but entirely separate. So you can have up to 50 breakout rooms inside of a meeting and the host can assign users either automatically, which means that you pick how many breakout rooms you want and Zoom will just randomly put in users and try and even it up. You can assign them manually. Um, I had an event on the weekend, it was CIO Summit Australia actually, and I was running that in the background. Um, and I had 280 users to individually and manually assign to breakout rooms based on who they wanted to speak to. Um, so I had a wine or a bottle after that. That was an incredibly stressful experience. Um, but now they can just choose their own room. You can rename the breakout room based on the speaker. The users can review those breakout rooms, join whichever one they want, pop out, join into someone else's if they're interested. Um, this is perfect inside of that education space as well. Obviously, it's really exciting to put people into little sub meetings. It means you can have so many topics going at once. You can have people who are in little um, discussion groups or focus groups talking about a topic or a question. And then when you're ready, you can bring everyone back to that main plenary session and they can discuss what they learned or, or developed inside of those breakout rooms. So really powerful inside of the event facilitation game because you can have you know, different speakers and different keynotes running at that same time. Um, local government, for instance, over here actually use it for their chamber meetings. So they have public chamber meetings over here, but a large portion of that chamber meeting is uh, not for public. So it's just private viewing only. So what we do is we put all the public into a breakout room and then they can't see what's happening in that main session. Inside of that breakout room, you might have a facilitator who's just going over, you know, the bullet points or getting feedback, maybe running some polls, all that kind of stuff. But it means you can have that main session entirely private. Um, and you can actually remove the ability for users to exit breakout rooms. So you can be pretty strict if you like. Um, but it's yeah, a really powerful uh, tool to use inside of that meeting environment. Um, when you close breakout rooms, it gives people a little countdown timer. So they've got either a minute or five minutes entirely up to you to kind of wrap up their conversations and then they'll head back to the main room. Uh, you can broadcast questions to breakout rooms as well. So as the host, if you have maybe a networking event and you've got 10 little networking breakout rooms, you can be broadcasting icebreaker questions, for instance. You have a facilitator in each room to kind of get the conversation going. But as the host, you're just broadcasting the messages of, you know, hey guys, we've got five minutes or, you know, those, those icebreaker questions, which are always good to, to keep that combo going. Um, so that's kind of breakout rooms. I mean, there's endless applications for breakout rooms. I've seen people use them in really, really amazing ways. Um, and it's honestly more about how, how creative you can be with them. Because now that, you know, the participants can choose them themselves, it makes it a lot easier to manage, which is obviously really important to be able to manage, manage the meeting as well. Cool. So the next one um, is something that I'm actually really passionate about is, is the use cases for meetings versus webinar. Um, so meetings is very open, very collaborative. It's what we're in now. Everyone's got video, everyone's got audio, everyone's kind of encouraged to engage. Um, however, when you move into the event space or anything, when you want a little bit more control, you move into the Zoom webinar space. So attendees, join a webinar with no video and no audio. So they are purely viewing. However, there's ways to engage, they can chat, and there is a really structured Q&A. So an attendee will post a question into that Q&A. If you like, you can allow the other attendees to upvote that question, which will move it to the top. 
So when that MC is reading out those questions to the speakers, it's going to read it. They're going to read out those most popular questions first, which is really great. Um, and so there's that really structured Q and A inside of that webinar environment. Because even though you know the users don't have audio and they don't have video, really important for them to be able to engage with those speakers and and let them be part of the event as well. Um, the meeting, uh, sorry, the, yes, the Zoom meeting environment doesn't have that Q and A. Um, but it does have breakout rooms. So it really just depends. I have a lot of customers. Uh, we, I work with a large amount of physical event companies over here and I've kind of transitioned them into the virtual space. Um, and a lot of the time what they'll do if they have a full summit going, for instance, CIO summit, they'll have a webinar for the first half of the day when they'll have their keynote speakers and all of that kind of one way traffic as far as communication goes. And then what they'll do is they'll actually move into a web uh, meeting, a meeting at the end of the day and push people into breakout rooms for those networking events. So you can move between two. I mean, there's a little bit of organization and some comms required, but you can definitely make it streamlined and then users do get the best of, of both experiences. Uh, what you also have inside of the webinar environment that you don't have inside of the meeting environment is the practice session. So with a practice session, only the panelists in that webinar can join first. So I like all of my speakers to show up maybe 20 minutes before, do last audio checks, last video checks, maybe go through that agenda one more time, go through any concerns, red flags, all that kind of stuff. And only the panelists can join into that webinar whilst I'm in practice session. When I'm ready to go and I've turned off everyone's video, that's when I broadcast the webinar and then the attendees start coming into that webinar. So we've done our overview, all my speakers are nice and prepared, they're all feeling confident and comfortable, and then I can start broadcasting that webinar. Um, so I guess the, the equivalent to that inside of the meeting space is the waiting room. Um, you can customize your waiting room and you can admit people either individually or all at once. Um, and that's kind of the equivalent, uh, but webinar obviously you've got more, more of that event feel to it. Um, but most of the other things are the same. You've got the polling, you've obviously got the shared screen, all of that great Zoom stuff. Registration as well, you can have enforced registration for meetings and webinars. Uh, they can be automatically accepted or you can manually vet those registrants before they get sent their registration. So if you, for instance, have a council chamber meeting or any kind of meeting um, that's pretty high profile, you may want to set that registration up and then manually vet those, those people just to make sure that they're not anyone untoward. Inside of the webinar environment, it's obviously really nice and safe. They don't have video, they don't have audio, there's no, I hate this term, but there's no Zoom bombing available to them. Um, Zoom bombing can only happen in a meeting if you haven't done your security right and so on and so forth. And I'm absolutely happy to talk about security. Um, if you guys have any questions about security, um, I'm not touching on it in this, in this PowerPoint because one, I'm frankly sick of talking about it. And two, there's way more exciting, amazing things to learn about Zoom rather than, you know, learning how to, put a passcode on or lock your meeting. Um, but yeah, so this is the, it's, it's a really nice little graphic actually, that meetings versus webinars. And I'm happy to, to, to pop this to you guys as well. Um, but really it's it's definitely more based on the engagement you're wanting. You know, Do you want everyone to be able to unmute their mic and have their say, or do you want it to be really structured in that Q&A? So it does depend, there's, there's definitely use cases for either. Um, and if you'd like to have any discussions around that, I mean, I've done so much event facilitation over the last six months um, that it's crazy. Um, but people love it. I mean, we've got our local government who are, you know, putting roads from Otaki to Levin who are just wanting feedback from the local community. So they'll put it open to a webinar to, you know, 20 people and get some questions and get that community focus going. So they can be small webinars. They can be huge webinars. You can do up to 50,000. That says 10. Um, but you can do up to 50,000 people in a webinar, which is a little bit stressful. <laughs> but at the end of the day, they don't have video or audio. So it's not actually that stressful at all. It's a large number, but very, very small um, requirements as far as managing those users. In a meeting, um, you can have up to 1,000. There's obviously lots of different tiers up to that. Um, a little bit harder to control participants. Not necessarily harder, but it's always good to have someone kind of in the background managing people, unmuting or... Um, turning on video when appropriate, all that kind of stuff. Alrighty, our next one is polling. So polling is something that I think just isn't used enough. Um, and in my opinion, the biggest benefit of polling is actually just providing something different than the user sitting there in front of their laptop looking at their screen. You know, Even if they're just using their mouse to click a button and answer a poll question, it's still something different. You're still changing the volume of what could potentially be a long event. 
Um, polls are great to start out with because it gets people excited. You know, a polling polling is quite a exciting tool. I mean, it's really simple and there's not a lot to it, but people go, oh, a question, I can answer that. Yay, what one do I want to pick? You know, and people love that. People love putting their own input in things. Um, and so having a poll at the start of the meeting to say, you know, hey, how's your day going? Are you feeling all right? You know, are you wearing your, you know, office pants or your pajamas, you know, would love to know, you know, something like that, just to get people in the mood, get them engaged, let them know that you are wanting their interaction, you know, it's you and them in this meeting, it's not just you, and especially in that webinar platform, you do need to make sure that you keep up that engagement with those users, I mean, a poll is a really great way to do that. Um, and that's obviously the, the lighter side of polls, but for instance, Taupo District Council, they use them in, in their council chambers meetings for their votes. So rather than everyone unmuting their microphones and saying, you know, Mark seconds this or I or, you know, all those kind of things, they just launch a poll. And so it's really clear, you know, who voted for what. So it's a very auditable process and for a pretty strict business activity, really. I mean, it's pretty in, innovative, really, for a district council to be using something like this for something as important as their council decisions but it's so simple for them to do and it's so clean and it's so reportable that they have no concerns about it um, and for their end users as well um, you can share the results so everyone gets to see not who voted for who but who, like which was the winning you know 20 percent of people voted for b 30 percent voted for c so on and so forth so you've got the poll you can launch as many as you like um, it's much easier if you pre-generate them so when you schedule the meeting or the webinar just jump onto zoom.us and actually pre-generate those polls so they're all ready to go. Um, but you can also just generate them in the middle of the meeting. Um, it's always good to have, you know, a facilitator in the background ready to just jump in and do that admin for you. But you can pre-generate or generate in real time. It's, it's really no problem. But you launch the poll, choose to end the poll whenever you want. There's no strict time frame on that. And then launch those results afterwards, generate that poll report, and, and then they're good to go. All right, and so next is, is something that makes so much difference is actually welcome graphics. So whenever, and this is something that I actually only came across when I started doing event facilitation for, for my customers, is actually having welcome graphics. And this can be in a meeting or a webinar. I use it largely in my webinars. Um, but what a welcome graphic and a thank you graphic does is it means that your MC or your host doesn't have to welcome people in every five seconds when someone jumps in. It's a virtual event. People aren't going to join at two o'clock on the dot. They're going to join at 157 and 203 and all the times between that. And what you don't want is the MC just kind of sitting there, like, hey, welcome, you know, we'll get started soon. And then, you know, they're picking their teeth or checking their phone or, you know, all that kind of stuff. You want it, even a standard meeting, you want it to have a nice look and feel. And especially if you're expecting a lot of people, having a welcome graphic shared, which just says, hey, you're in the right place, you know, don't worry, you're, you've, you've clicked the right link, you're all ready to go. Um, it's going to get started shortly. I use Canva because I love Canva. <laughs> it's so easy and it's so great. And you can have videos. So like this little welcome um, one here actually has a really beautiful video of the Auckland Harbour. So there's boats that go past, the clouds move. So it's quite a nice thing for people to watch, you know, and you don't have to have video as long as really people know that they're in the right place that's the most important thing. What I also do is I just play some royalty-free Spotify in the background, because if you just put up the graphic, people will send in the chats, hey, I can't hear anything as it started yet. But if you've got Spotify playing, they can see the graphic, they can hear the music, they know they're in the right place and they're ready to go and you're ready to go. Um, so whilst that's being shared, I'm, you know, I'm looking at that attendee list, making sure I've got the numbers I'm wanting. When ready, I turn on the video of my MC, if it's me, obviously myself, um, but I have everyone's video off until I'm ready to go. So I prompt the video of that MC, I unmute their microphone. Once I see their video pop up, I stop sharing that screen and that audio and they welcome everyone in. So it's a really clean, professionally run way to start the webinar or meeting for that matter. Um, and same at the end. So you always wanna say thank you to your guests. Um, and it's a great place to have, you know, please get in touch if you have any questions or here's some websites that we mentioned or all of that kind of stuff. Because just like at the start of the event, when people join in over a little while, people also leave the webinar in, you know, six to 10 minutes. So it does take a while. And what you want to avoid is just ending the meeting straight away and kicking everyone off. Because it's quite aggressive, it's quite abrasive. You know, the host kicked you out of the meeting is quite an aggressive thing to see as a participant. 
So if you've got a nice thank you slide at the end of the day, you know, it's great that they attended your event or your meeting, you've still got that Spotify playing in the background. So you've got some nice exit music. If it's an event, I actually play applause track. So you get a nice kind of like round of applause sound, which is quite cool because that's definitely what you miss about an in-person event is that, uh, that clapping and that applause. Um, so you can do all that in your in your thank you slide. And it's just a really great way to start and end your meeting. It just kind of wraps it up in a really nice, really considerate bow. Um, and yeah, and I do it for all of my events. I create a huge amount of graphics for my um, customers using Canva. If you haven't used Canva, I can't re recommend it enough. It's just the easiest tool to use in the whole world. Um, so yeah, definitely give it a go if you haven't already. And the next one is recording transcriptions. So recording transcriptions is incredible, um, really powerful in the legal space. Law firms over here in New Zealand love recording transcriptions because obviously it's such an important part of all of their meetings is having that record. Um, and so Zoom allow on that business plan to automatically record your transcripts. Um, it is editable. So if you're someone like me who talks really fast or passionately, how people like to say, um, and sometimes with a little bit of an accent, apparently, um, you can just go through and edit. So before you send this to a client or before you downloaded that transcript, you would just go through and make a couple of edits, nice and simple, in that online platform. Um, and you'll have a 100% accurate um, transcript for your meeting. The transcript itself is naturally uh, really, really accurate. Um, Zoom use Otter AI, which are market leaders in the artificial intelligence game in um, America. Um, so they've utilized Otter AI for this. Um, and very shortly, you'll have the live transcription available in meeting as well. So rather than assigning someone to have be doing those closed captioning, you can allow Otter AI to be producing those live transcripts for you. Um, I'm just about to do an accessibility week um, next week, and I'm going to be focusing on all this cool stuff. Um, and obviously, transcribe transcriptions inside of meetings are such an important part of that accessibility piece. Um, and it's an important part that we all need to be aware of, and we all need to be feel responsible for at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, transcription is, is just promoting that. Um, but another great part of the transcript is actually the searchable um, functionality. So if you're looking at a two hour long board meeting and you only really care about the August budget, you can type the word August. It'll show you all the places in the transcript and also a long that video timeline where that word August was said. So if you're trying to you know, get that, that great information from the meeting and you want to get rid of all the gaff and all the fluff and you don't have time to sit down and watch two hours, search for those keywords jump to the parts in the video where they were, and you can just segment whatever your, your required little watching patterns are. So it's just efficiency. Efficiency is one of my favorite words. <laughs> um, it's such an important part of, of your day um, is to be efficient. And you know, searchable transcripts is just such an easy, efficient tool to use. The next one, so this is the Zoom portal. So the Zoom portal is zoom.us and this is the background of Zoom. So the Zoom application is where you do your scheduling or do your hosting, all of that kind of stuff. But there's a huge wealth of power behind that application and it's a Zoom portal. So every user has access to the portal in a profile kind of sense, just like this here. They can change their profile picture, they can add their job title, company, all that kind of stuff. They can check their scheduled meetings, um, jump into their recordings, jump into their settings, all that kind of stuff. So for instance, if you wanted to customize your waiting room, put a little picture in there, change your little bio, that's where you've got to do it. So the portal is where you do all that quite heavy stuff. I mean, it would be, if they imported all of this into the Zoom application, it would be too messy and too busy. So they've left it on zoom.us and every user can access that on their own accord. Um, when you move into the admin, management side of things. Um, so I'm actually responsible for the large scale license deployments across New Zealand. So when I'm talking to the IT teams and the you know product managers and the corporate um, the corporate product managers inside of these uh, institutions, they need to be able to manage their users and their Zoom deployment and their Zoom tenancy. And they also do that from the Zoom portal with elevated privileges so they can see all of the users, all of the settings, turn things off, lock things, all of that great stuff. So the Zoom portal is really, really powerful. If you haven't had a look yet, you definitely should. Um, and if you have someone who's responsible for the Zoom tenancy inside of your organization, they 100% 
need to be looking at the Zoom portal. They can turn settings on and off, which will affect all of your users. So it can actually streamline the process for your end users as well, rather than each individual person having to you know, manually change their dial-in numbers if it's not in the US, because the US is the default. You know, So rather than each user jumping in and doing that, you as an admin can just set that as a default for all of your users. Um, and language interpretations, uh, something that you can set on, on Zoom as well. So interpretation was brought out a month or so ago, I believe, um, but they've just released a new update. I like to think that I'm involved because I hounded the team all day and night for this, but to have custom languages. So what we now have is the ability to have multi interpretation. Um, and this is actually amazing. I mean, New Zealand Parliament are one of uh, they're definitely my favorite customer, but they're one of our biggest customers and users of Zoom. And so now they get to provide a multi interpreter to all of their meetings, which is beautiful, really. I definitely shed a couple of tears as I do um, when, when I got that enabled. Um, but that's amazing. It's, it's bringing our people into our meetings and that's just stunning. So all of that power, all of that configuration and, and customizable stuff is all in that Zoom portal. So just, yeah, in, incredibly powerful stuff in there. And that was kind of my top 10 tips or things to think about. Um, now Michelle did mention that she wanted me to quickly go over some updates. There's been 10,000 updates for you know the last however long, um, but I thought I'd just touch on a couple of them. Um, the first one is this little graphic down the bottom. So this is the Zoom for Home. So Zoom for Home, that screen is about 27 inches. So that's a, that's a laptop screen size. And what that is, is it's an all-in-one interactive device. So if you are Zooming from home or if you're a CIO or anyone really that has your own little office and you do a lot of Zooming, you've got this Zoom device that sits on your desk. It's interactive. So you've got all that whiteboarding you meet, you've got your contacts, you've got your phone, you've got everything from this Zoom device. It's really slim, really thin profile, but perfect for you know, your CIOs or anyone really um, who does a lot of Zooming. Um, what it can also do is act as a second monitor. So if you, even outside of the Zoom environment, don't wanna have three monitors on your desk, you can have your laptop and a D10Me. Um, and that means that you've got that beautiful interactive capability inside of that, that Zoom world or in that Zoom meeting webinar space, but then you just utilize it as a second monitor as well. Um, so really powerful. Uh, obviously, working from home is such a huge deal now. And there's ways that we can make working from home easier, better, more secure. Um, I have my D10Me on the way. I'm so excited. I'm you know constantly doing emails and stuff throughout Zoom. So having to move from my Zoom to other applications on my one device is a little bit frustrating. So when I can just do it for my D10Me, it's going to be amazing. Um, there's no extra licensing required. You don't have to pay for a Zoom room or anything, even though you get that beautiful Zoom room UI. Um, but yeah, it just allows you to have your own personal Zoom experience. It's yours only. You're logged in. So if you call someone, it is coming from you. It's not a, a room or a device that is coming from you. Um, and that's, yeah, so that's probably one of the more exciting things that, that's come out in the last kind of three months or so. Um, and a couple of other ones here. So a uh, post webinar survey. So that means that you can launch a little Zoom webinar survey at the end of a webinar. Great to get feedback about the format of the event or if you wanted to get any more information from people, um, you can now have that inbuilt into Zoom. Previously, you could only do it through a third party like a survey monkey, which just means that it directs you to another tab, which is not as clean. Um, so this is just an inbuilt Zoom webinar survey. Um, they've upped the meeting limits to 30 hours. We had some um, radio presenters that did the world's longest Zoom call and it cut out at 23 hours and 59 minutes, which was hilarious because that was Zoom's um, limit. To be fair, it's probably an unexplored concept. I can't think of anything worse than being on a Zoom call for an entire day. <laughs> um, but, you know, Zoom was hot topic and these radio presenters decided to test it out. So Zoom, um, as a response to that, pushed it to now 30 hours of a meeting duration, which is insane. <laughs> end-to-end um, -end encryption. So this was one of the things that caused a stir for Zoom, obviously, is end-to-end -end encryption. End-to-end -end encryption is available now, um, but what people don't understand is the limitations of end-to-end -end encryption. Um, people, yeah, so basically, if you choose to have end-to-end -end encryption enabled across your account, um, you set it at a per meeting level. So as a host, I choose to have end-to-end -end encrypted um, le a level of encryption on that meeting. But what that means is that I cannot have dial-in users. I cannot have users joining from browser. I cannot have users joining from SIP or H.323 because you cannot encrypt 
two clients if there are any of those other connections coming in it's not possible um and so it is available zoom did bring it out because people were screaming for it um but we are yet to have anyone pick it up because it genuinely just limits the zoom experience so much and all these people that were yelling and screaming and now like oh okay maybe i'll just stick to the market leading natural encryption that zoom offers oh okay that's great <laughs> um yeah, and so so that, that that is great. I mean, we've got the Minister of Foreign and Trade, obviously a huge international organisation which we're planning to um, employ into in um, at a, a limited standpoint. Um, but yeah, I mean, Zoom is encrypted regardless uh, using AES two five six, which is the market standard anyway. Um, now, multi spotlight and multi pin. So this is really important um, from one an accessibility perspective. Multi pin being I as a user can pin the video of the speaker and the video of my sign language interpreter on that screen and just have those two videos so it's nice and clean for me to for my viewing experience um, so pinning pinning is just um, changing my view for me whereas multi spotlight is changing it as the host for others so as a teacher if i had you know a group of students in a breakout room and i've then brought everyone back to that main session and i want those students to then present their their learnings or their developments from that breakout room I can spotlight up to nine people at once and they'll be th that view for everyone. So it's actually really powerful um, considering you could only um, uh, you could only spotlight one user um, at a time previously, which is tough also in that event space. If you are running events on meetings, um, it's hard to have a panel discussion because you have a gallery view, whereas now you can just multi spotlight all of those those panel judges or those, those panel keynotes. Um, and really control that environment for your end users as the host. So pin for yourself, customize your own environment. Spotlight is pinned for your users effectively for everyone inside of that meeting. Um, and you, outside of that, there's like literally hundreds of updates from Zoom. I do one monthly with my team um, and, and our customers as well to let them know what's happening. Um, and I do, you know, monthly newsletters and that kind of stuff. But I would definitely suggest you guys uh, keep up to date with the likes of the support page. There's a Zoom blog, you can subscribe to the Zoom updates. There's always stuff coming out, you know, 80% of them you might not be interested in, but there might be one that spurs on a new use case, which could provide value in your organization, or just something that you've been wanting for for ages. Um, and yeah, and so that's 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 kind of, that's, that's it for me effectively. Um, I almost kept to time. I was one minute over Michelle, so I'm very sorry, <laughs> but much better than I've done before. So baby steps. I'd just like um, to say, who wants a 30-hour meeting? Seriously? Yeah, I know. I know. Um, so, so with the, the questions, Michelle, yeah. do you want me to just read them out or do you yeah, want to you, read them? No, no, no. You go for it in the chat room. There's a fair few in there. So do you want to go through them? Cool. Perfect. Um, all righty. So one from Michelle, actually. So with that sharing PowerPoint as your background. So yes, PowerPoint only at this stage does work. Okay. So I would suggest, um, I always download my Canva presentations into PowerPoint and then it's fine. Okay. So yeah, just, just download them into PowerPoint. So at this stage, yes, it is just that Microsoft PowerPoint application that it works with. Mm -hmm. um, one from Lisbeth. So is this new screen feature already deployed? Um, the PowerPoint one? Yes, absolutely. So make sure that you are updating your clients. Um, Zoom don't manually push updates because people got really angry about it. So you'll need to manually update your client. Um, so if you click your profile picture at the top right of your desktop application, it'll drop down a little menu for you and you can click check for updates. It'll let you know what the update is. It'll give you a little overview of those release notes and then let you update that application. Um, if you're someone like me who checks literally every day in case there's a new update, you don't have to do that, but they'd be like once every fortnight or so. Um, but yes, it's available now. You might just need to update your client. But Sammy, is that on the desktop version as well as the app that's on your desktop or do you have to log into the web browser? Uh, not, not the web browser, just the application itself. That, okay, no drama. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, can we have multiple polling questions in a webinar? Yes, absolutely. So you can have as many polls as you like ready. Your polls can have multiple questions as well. So I mean, a standard poll is just one question, but if you have like a series of questions, um, I have a lot of customers to do like wine tastings over over zoom um, and they have like 10 10 poll questions for each poll so yes you absolutely can um, or you can just have different polls that you launch at different times but either way you can generate them beforehand or generate them inside of that meeting but maybe get someone else to do it but yes absolutely multiple options 
Uh, blah, 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 blah. Can you use a welcome graphic for a Zoom meeting? Um, yes, absolutely, because all you're doing is sharing your screen, right? So what I do is I create the image on Canva, I download it as an image file, I put it full screen on my laptop, on my, sorry, my second monitor, and I'm just sharing the content. So that's all you're doing, you're just sharing that content, but I make sure that everyone's video and audio is off, so they, they don't see anyone, they just see that graphic. Okay, so it's just, you're using a scare, sharing screen option. Yeah, yeah, that's all you're doing. It's nice and simple. You're literally okay. just sh sharing an application. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and to answer the next one, so yep, it's just sharing. So it's, it's not about enterprise level or anything like that. You're just sharing that content. Anyone in your meeting can share content um, naturally inside of a Zoom meeting. Webinar is different, obviously. Those attendees can't. Um, but yes, in a normal meeting, anyone can share that content. Um, if I'm doing event facilitation, I like to distribute that role's responsibilities quite a lot. So I might be responsible for sharing the content and playing the Spotify, but someone else may be responsible for turning on the videos off those MCs and managing the polls, the chat, the q and A. I I like to, you know, share the, share the load a little bit. I think that's really important, especially if you're running a really high profile event like the CIO Summit. Um, you know, at the end of the day, people are paying almost $1,000 to what is effectively sitting in front of their own laptop in their own house. <laughs> um, so you need to have, it needs to run really professionally and that's why you get your little, um, your, your little roles responsibilities all shared out and then it can run, run really nicely. And da, 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 da. polls can be anonymous, Elizabeth. Yes, yeah, so when you have a poll, you can choose if they're allowed to be anonymous or not. So it's entirely up to you. So yes, if users want to ask anonymously, if you've allowed them to, they absolutely can. Um, and yes, just in time for Māori Language Week, uh, Parliament did a little bit of a, a, a little scenario on it, which was amazing. I, yeah, Parliament do incredible stuff with Zoom. I love how they're talking to the people and bringing us into our local and national government. Um, and they're always doing really exciting things with Zoom um, and on LinkedIn and stuff. So yeah, Māori Language Week was a big, big week for us um, and them. Um, and that's all the questions. Does anyone else have any questions? If you guys want to take yourself off and unmute and throw some questions at Sammy. I have a question, Sammy. I want to Hi, say thank you. I'm based in Paris and it was totally worth getting up at two in the morning because I always learn something new. I also <laughs> attended the previous uh, webinar as well. My question is, if you are running a webinar and you want a, the webinar to go smoothly mm -hmm. and you're sharing about two or three videos during the webinar, do you have to check the box, share computer sound, or does it, you can still run, um, share your video without checking that box um you you can it won't stop you from sharing but what that tick box actually does is it increases zoom's frame rate per second so if you notice your video is a little bit laggy or a little bit jumpy that's because zoom's frame rate is just a little bit lower because it's supposed to deal with images so what you're doing by ticking that box is saying hey zoom i'm playing a video you need to work a little bit harder my users need to see a good quality video so it won't stop you from sharing if you don't tick it but if you are sharing a video, um, definitely tick that box. If okay, you've forgotten, you. um, when you share screen, you know, that little bar that you get at the top of your screen, there is a more option and that allows you to kind of tick it without stopping share and starting again. So if, okay. if you're in the middle of a video and people are saying, it's terrible, why is it so jumpy? You can just quickly jump up to the top, click more, click optimize, and it'll start increasing that frame rate. Oh, thanks. Anyone else? Amazing. Well, 365 is still down, everyone. So if you're in the 365 world, it's going to be a while till it's up. I was just checking. Um, Sammy, thank you so much. I think there's always something we can learn on Zoom. And I think, as you guys know, it's about being confident when you're running a meeting or you're coming into a meeting and having all these additional resources, such as the polling. I mean, I think the virtual background that you did for um, yourself is fantastic. That's a great feature mm -hmm. because, as you said, you're not a little square box with your presentation here. You're actually part of the presentation. And I did use that last week. So I was going to say I encourage you guys it's rolled out in Australia now so you can obviously use it um, and I think also the other good thing is integrations we always always forget about the integrations um, you know whether you're using Slack, Teams, Gmail, you know Asana, Monday whatever platform you're using um, ensure that it's integrated because then you've got more capacity it works smoother um, and you can communicate more effectively so yes if there's no more questions I think what time is it I think we will Love you and leave you. I'm just looking. 10.53, there you go. You got seven minutes, guys. So 
have an incredible day. I think for the guys that are in 365 world, I think you should just pack your bags up and go home if you're not already home because you're not going to get much done today. Um, but, you know, also maybe use the, the Zoom chat and calling function. I think it's really, really good. A lot of people don't use it um, and it's a backup. So if you're in there, you can see whether someone's online. You don't have to go back to Microsoft Teams. You don't have to go to email. You're there, you, you know, and you send a quick message. Hey, you got a quick chat and you don't have to schedule a meeting and it takes the um, formality away from, hey, can we have a Zoom call? You can see they're online then. So don't forget about that, ch that chat function. Um, people don't use it enough. I don't know why, but yeah. I agree. Yeah. Amazing. Well, guys, have a fantastic Tuesday. Thank you for joining for another shot of tech. Um, as I said, we've got some great things coming up. We've got jam boards for Google lovers. We've got Asana coming up. Um, I've also got um, an incredible EA from Brisbane and she's going to answer any Microsoft Teams questions you have. So we're going to do an hour of power of Q&A. So it won't be presentation that's coming up. Um, we've also got BASE coming up, which I said to you guys earlier along that hasn't really rolled out in Australia, but there's a bit of buzz about it. I'm still figuring out which Jackie from... Uh, uh, overseas we were just talking about before so there's some great sessions coming up enjoy school holidays for all the parents and I will see you guys